We are in week number four about worship, on the subject of worship, and I, I kind of like this subject. I will uh, forewarn you that because I'm plowing through this subject, you're going to hear a lot of things just interwoven through today that you've maybe heard me talk about before because this is the core of who I am. Uh, this subject is my core value. It is my favorite subject. And if I had my way, it would be the only subject I would ever preach. Because I've had a revelation of worship many, many years ago. And it's a little bit different. And it colors the way I look at worship. I can't help it. It just colors it. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of folks feel like I'm critical of worship music. I'm not critical. I, I just have a different take. I start from a different point of worship. And my starting point is not about what God can do for me because that isn't worship. And what God has done for me is testimony. But who he is and what he's worth and the fact that he really doesn't owe us anything else drives me to worship and I can't help myself. And that's my starting place. So when I hear little ditty songs about I, 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 me, 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 I get frustrated. Because it isn't about me, nor I. It's about him. Worship has to all be him. Everything to him, everything about him, everything for him. You get so lost in him that you disappear. That's the whole idea. Much worship just teaches us how to thank him for what he's brought us through. But there's a deeper place where we totally disappear. And it's only him. Where we don't even see ourselves in the room anymore. Where our agendas, our thoughts, our life has become hidden. Because he's so amazing that we can't think to take a moment to say one word about us. And it almost feels in those moments that it's rude to ask for anything because he's too awesome. Do you all understand me? I call this the wow, the wow factor. I told you a few weeks ago, I told the story about my, my, uh, my girlfriend who is now my wife and still my girlfriend. I told you about the day that I met her or not met her, but saw her. I wrote about it many times because it's possible to see someone many, many times, but never really see them. It's very possible to be in the kingdom of God and in the church and in the house of the Lord and in community and know everything about the Lord theologically and sing the songs by rote because you know them. It's very possible to stand at the altar, but yet have never been wowed, have never been overcome by who he is. Remember, whatever you magnify becomes the biggest. When you magnify you, when you magnify your trouble, when you magnify your need, it gets bigger. But it says in the scripture, oh, magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. And in that magnification, everything else, as the writer says, the things of the world go strangely dim. I've come to worship him before when I felt like my heart was breaking, when I felt like people didn't understand me, when I felt like I'd been overlooked and I felt like my life was not getting off the ground. I felt like all of my enemies were winning <laughs> and quite frankly, secretly in my heart, I was a little frustrated with God himself because of my situation. But in those moments when I sacrificed and forced myself to magnify him, oh, it didn't happen the first couple of minutes, but as time went by, I saw him bigger and everything else got smaller. Friends, it's that simple. Your problems aren't that big. You just need a bigger God. 
Your situation is not that hard. You just need a more powerful God. Your family's not that lost. You just need a saving God. Your body's not that destroyed and racked with pain. You just need a healing God. Oh, I feel him here today. I can't help myself. Can't help myself. I had eaten at my father-in-law's restaurant many, many times and sat at dinner with my wife now, with her sisters, with friends from his restaurant. On Tuesdays, he would close his restaurant and we would all call, we called it Fat Tuesday. He closed his restaurant and we all went to the restaurant and I had a lady who is a beautiful black lady named Miss Ruth Swain who could cook cream corn and collard greens on a level yet to be appreciated by most. <laughs> we would make cornbread, I would bake apple pies. We would have grilled chicken, fried chicken, green beans, mm, let's just go on now. <laughs> on Fat Tuesday, and I sat there even stirring beans with my wife-to-be thinking this is a nice young lady, but never ever really saw her. Until one day, church was about to start. I was in the pastor's lounge. I looked out through the blinds and here came a blue dress with beautiful curly auburn hair. She was fussing with her hair. I remember her shoes. I remember exactly on her forearm where the purse was. And it's as though I had never seen her in my life. And it was so profound that I could not help but say something. And what came out of my mouth was, wow. <laughs> How can you possibly be wowed when you've seen them before? That's what I'm after with today's message. I want to invite you to be wowed by God. It hit me that many of us spend so many years of our lives around the things of God, but we never experience the wow. And the first time I saw Amber was powerful, but the thrill of that still can't compare with the wow I experienced with God when he manifests his presence. Have you ever experienced God's wow? Perhaps you've faithfully attended church, you've received the Lord Jesus as your savior, there's a good chance you've served as a Sunday school teacher, a choir member, a volunteer in some way, but yet have never experienced the wow. I'm discovering that there are pastors and ministers and staff members all over the nation who have never honestly experienced the wow. They're faithful in their service, they're sincere in their service, they're sincere and directed in everything they do. But God is somehow still an object to be worshiped and a sugar daddy to be asked of, but they yet have not seen his wow. The apostle Paul would, was probably the most well-educated and theologically advanced person in all of the early church. Yet he wrote something that should put most of us in the modern church, organizations, seminaries, and worship systems into cardiac arrest. He wrote this. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Here's his cry, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship is of his suffering being made conformable unto his death if by any means that I should attain unto the resurrection of the dead. 
This passionate statement of Paul was not content to settle for mere knowledge of God, nor was it content with simple mental assent to the concepts of God. Paul threw out a lifetime of highly respected theological and religious achievement and called it dung before he virtually cried out, that I may know him. You can tell if you've been around someone who's been wowed. They're just not happy with anything but him. And there's this insatiable cry in their heart, I gotta know him. And we look at them and go, but you're a theologian. You studied, you know, you know all about him. And they go, oh no, 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 no. I wanna know him. There was nothing casual about Paul's Christianity. His relationship to God was anything but disinterested third person relationship with some distant caretaker God who remained aloof from human affairs. I thought I knew a lot about God, but then one day I was wowed by him. I'll never forget it. I was fully overcome physically, mentally, and spiritually by the glory of his presence when he came near. To see him like that for the first time immediately sets something in motion. You realize that you want more than merely to know who he is. And you want more than secondhand evidences. See, faith is obviously necessary in every transaction with God, but it was Jesus who took things far beyond mental agreement when he said that we should not stop there. He said, look at this, NIV, Revelation 3.20, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Many of us here today that grew up in church, we're, we're in great fear of the I word. We won't say it most of the time because we fear it. The word is intimate. Intimate. I'm afraid of the I word because God uses two human analogies to help us understand the intimate way he relates to us. First and most importantly, the Bible describes our relationship with God in the terms of intimacy and covenant relationship of a husband and a wife. Is anybody here? Yes. Number two, the second analogy from human experience is the intimate relationship of a parent and a child. These are the two analogies that God Almighty uses in his word when he's talking about his people. Husband and wife, parent and child. God speaks unashamedly of the lover and the beloved throughout the Song of Songs. John the Baptist characterizes Jesus as the bridegroom. John the Revelator did the same. While picturing the new Jerusalem, he calls it a glorious church of redeemed Jews and Gentiles, and he calls them the bride of the Lamb. See, intimacy involves more than surface contact. Consider the difference between a one night stand and a marriage relationship. In a one night stand, you get your own physical needs met and you walk away without any consideration and you probably are not going to call. But in a genuine relationship and marriage, the consummation of the marriage is followed by a lifetime of covenant commitment and growing intimacy in spirit, soul, and body. You're there for the joy, you're there for the suffering. You stand together when it's good, you stand together when it's bad, in health and sickness, in life and death. Although physical appearances always change in the course of human marriage, the covenant of marriage remains in effect without yielding or changing to the circumstances. Paul said, this is the relationship I want with God. I don't wanna to touch 
I don't want a moment of euphoria. I don't want to just lay on the floor for a night and have him overcome me by his presence. I want to know him in his suffering. I want to know what causes Christ's heart to break. I want to know what he thinks. I want to know how he feels. I don't want to just hit my marks so I look religious and pious. I don't want to just hit my marks so everybody goes, isn't he a great man? No, I don't care. I want to know him. I want to know what breaks his heart. I want to know how he feels. I want to know him as a person, not as just an eternal being. I want to know how he thinks. I want to know what makes him happy. I want to know what brings him joy. I have to know him. Paul says, I've got to know him. And in doing so, see, when you want to know someone like that, the world is full of surface people. It's so good to see. Aren't you great? Oh, God bless you. Love you, love you, love you, love you. Let's go on a date Friday night. You put on your best outfit. Fix your hair. Put on your makeup. Best shoes. Borrow somebody's car because you don't want to go take her out in your beater. <laughs> it's all about impressing. You sit over the table at dinner and because it's only surface, you talk about yourself. And she talks about herself. And you try to find if between the two selves, there's something to connect with. If there is no connection, you lie like a dog. And you say, wasn't that a nice, we had a good evening, thank you so much, I'll call you. Have y'all seen that commercial where it said, what if people just told the truth? Oh, yeah. Good night. Had a good time. We're probably never going to see each other again. I'm going to tell you I'll call, but I won't. <laughs> How many dates have we been on like that, right? It's all surface. See, people come to God, and there's nothing wrong with how you come. I'm glad you're coming. But we come to God, and we go, this is my mess. It's called my life. I'm a wreck. I'm an addict. I've got problems. Beneath the surface, if everybody knew how wrecked I really was, no one would shake my hand. And we come to God, and we want God to kind of put a shine on the mess. Just put a good religious shine on it, Lord. Just coat it real good and, and shine it so that at least when I come around the people of God, I look like I've got it together. Even though beneath that crust of religious veneer, I'm falling to pieces. Some people do that Easter and Christmas. The Creasters. <laughs> they come twice a year to put a spit shine on their religion. Or some people come to church and get in their car before anybody can talk to them. Because we don't want you, they don't want you to know how broken they are. <laughs> when Paul said he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and his suffering, he was saying, I want to share in the power of his victory and the pain of his suffering. Wait a minute. God suffers? That's what it said. Why would Paul say, I want to know him in the pain of his suffering if he doesn't suffer? Well, I thought God has no suffering. The only suffering in God's life is when he sees humanity reject him. And Paul says, I want to know him in that. I want to know, Jesus, what it makes you feel like when people use your name in vain. I want to know what it's like when people almost get persuaded to be a believer, but yet they spit in your face and go, I'll try another way. I want to know what Jesus thinks when the majority of, of, of society agrees that there are many ways to God, not just one. I want to know what Jesus thinks when the whole world rebels against him and says, oh, Jesus is just one path to God. There are many others. What must Jesus think when he stood in front of the disciples and said, I am the way, the truth, the life. But yet those who grew up in the church are now spewing and spitting the lies that there are other ways and very proud of themselves that they've become enlightened. 
It brings Christ suffering. The Bible says that when you have tasted forgiveness and you decide there's another way, you walk on his blood, he suffers. See, you've probably never heard a preacher preach this way because you've been listening to Saul. Saul wants to preach the sermon that makes you impressed. But you don't have a Saul in this pulpit. You got someone who cares. I don't know why. I'm not wonderful. But somewhere along the way, I had an experience with him. And I saw him as a person that can be related to. And I didn't see him as a religious device to get me to my next high point. I saw him as a weeping Christ and a suffering Lord that says, come to me all ye that are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. And then I wondered what he said when we wouldn't. I think I have good company with Paul, don't you? Paul wasn't praying for houses. Paul wasn't praying for land or wealth or freedom from pain and adversity. And all these things are nice, I like them. No sin in liking nice things. Many things are necessities. And they're always on our wish list. But the only thing Paul wanted to know, I want to know Christ. And this passage from Paul's epistle in Philippians was originally written in Greek. Paul's understanding of the term to know was thoroughly Hebrew or Jewish. Hebrew version of to know is yada. And it describes the deepest level of intimacy known to the human race. It's also described yada as one flesh, the union of a husband and wife. And it's also described in a way that a person can know God by his word and do, and by doing it, become one with it. God wants you to become yada to his word infused all together where you're one with his word. You do his word. You don't even shrink back from it. And when your flesh argues, you go, all right, you've had your say. Now shut up. The word says. There are a million reasons why I can live an ungodly life, but there's one in the scripture that says I have to come out from among it and be separate. There are a million reasons why I should live with someone uh, without the bond of marriage, but the scripture calls it fornication. So therefore, I will come out from among it. I'm preaching to you today. There are a lot of reasons that lying might be okay, but let me make it clear. All liars have their part in the lake of fire. That's what Yada says. And because I'm one with it, my soul cries out to me. You lying boy, shut your mouth and put the truth in it and find a place to repent of your lying tongue. Because the Lord says, I take no pleasure in those who hold back. Take no pleasure in those who go, I'm gonna keep this, this is too precious. When you become fused with his word, you become yachted with him. You become intimate with him, you're one. You know one of the worst marriage situations is? When pe- married people think they're single. Anybody know what I'm talking I-, I know I've lost some of y'all. I preached too hard. That was too hard. You thought, oh, they're soapboxing. I'm just preaching it because nobody else is. Somebody's got, you we're kind of in a mess here. Somebody needs to say what the word says. Not from a judgmental anger. I'm not angry because I have to fuse myself to this as well as you. And my flesh hates it. I fight with my, do you mind fight with the flesh besides me? Or is it just me? Oh man, I, 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 you know, I'm a liar by nature. I just, you know, if it's convenient, we'll tell a little white lie. You know, that's who we are, right? But when the word says, see, when, when he wrote this word, it's not full of suggestions. It, 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 it's he who loves me keeps my word. Now, see, what we've messed up with preaching in the years ago is we beat everybody on the head. And the preachers who were preaching the meanest were sending the most. Beat everybody to death over their, over their sin, right? And then secretly we found out, ooh, 
bats were in the belfry. <laughs> See, it's not for that purpose. It's this is his love letter. And this is his love language. And there are things in here he loves and things in here that bring him pain. And because I'm in love with him, I don't want to bring him pain. And I get angry with myself when I do. And I go to him. See, I get young married some time and, and I don't know why our marriage is not working. But every Tuesday night he wants to go play ball with his friends. His single friends. And he didn't get permission. See, when you become married, you're one. One. There's not two people anymore. There's one. Now, this is hard for us to hear. One, we make decisions together as one. We decide together as one. I serve her, she serves me. I go, baby, you like to ride horses? Go ride horses. She goes, baby, you want to go play ball with your friends? Go play ball with your friends. There's nothing wrong with either one of those. What's wrong is when I demand that I maintain my single life while ignoring my married life. Is that true? Yada, one. When I come to Christ, what makes my Christianity hard to live is when I'm still trying to live like me. And I'm not looking at his love letter and going, oh, he doesn't like that. I think I'll stop it. Why? Because I want to know him. We're talking about marriage relationships. If you want physical relationship from your mate, it doesn't start when you turn the lights out. It starts when you turn the lights on. It starts when you get up in the morning. 